Hello and welcome to our worship again today. Uh, recorded as you can see in my back garden with the birds uh, chirping away as we think about um, some of Jesus's miracles. Two particular miracles will come up in our gospel story and we'll be reflecting on the power of healing and the way in which it changes who people are. We'll talk about that a little bit later but let's begin with our opening responses. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts, and triumph over the shades of night. Blessed are you, Creator God, to you be praise and glory forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the works of your hands. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your spirit ever renew our lives and our, your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. Our first hymn then is written by George Herbert um, towards the uh, start of the uh, 17th century. Um, King of glory, King of peace, I will love thee. Set, of course, to a Welsh hymn tune, uh, Gwalch Mai. King of glory, King of peace, I will love thee. And that love may never cease, I will move thee. <laughs> Our first reading from Ellen, from the second letter to the Corinthians. The first reading is taken from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 8, verses 7 to 15. You excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in utmost eagerness and in our love for you. So we want you to excel also in this generous undertaking. I do not say this as a command but I am testing the genuineness of your love against the earnestness of others. For you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. And in this matter I am giving my advice. It is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something, but even to desire to do something. Now finish doing it, so that your eagerness may be matched by completing it according to your means. For if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of a fair balance between your present abundance and their need, 
so that their abundance may be for your need, in order that there may be a fair balance. As it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second hymn today is by John Bell from the Iona community. Um, it goes to a traditional Scottish tune, Ye Banks and Braes, um, which uh, you probably kind of, you know, like me, think, oh, I know it from somewhere. And once you hear the intro, you'll recognise the, uh, the tune. We cannot measure how you heal or answer every sufferer's prayer, yet we believe that your grace responds where faith and doubt unite to care. Words by John Bell. We cannot measure how you heal. Our gospel reading then from St Mark. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Mark chapter 5 verses 21 to 43. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak, for she said, If I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. 
Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha cum, which means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Where do we begin then with Paul's second letter to the Corinthians? There's a, um, a bit of biblical uh, scholarship which says that first bit about you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, knowledge, in utmost eagerness, is actually a bit of kind of um, satire. But actually they don't excel in these things they actually fall well short and that's why he's having to admonish them about generosity but it is interesting to think that the problems that affect the church in 2000 years ago are probably the same problems that affect the church today that sense in which actually we have to recognize that we are a band of brothers and sisters across the world and that actually we need to be mutually supportive and upholding. And that's very difficult, isn't it? Um, I've been just been doing something on living in love and faith, which is the church's um, uh, course um, and support for questions about identity, sexuality, uh, relationships and marriage. And it's a very interesting and challenging course. And, and we hope to run one at some stage in the near future. And, and I'd love to have your input on it. But it's also kind of quite challenging because I think I know what I believe and then somebody points something out in the text and you go, oh, actually, maybe there's something to be learnt here. And so when we look at this wonderful little bit of um, text from Paul to the church in Corinth, what can we learn? What can we absorb into our lives, which perhaps changes the way we look at the world? So he's reminding his congregation that although they might think they know all the answers, they don't. And one of the reasons that they don't, that they kind of get themselves in that state is because they raise themselves up, whereas Jesus came back down. That idea of the contrast between the Son of God who dwells in the heavens, who the very word of God who created the, the, the universe, the cosmos, everything that's in it, comes down to be with us. For our sakes he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Not materially rich, you know, not like some prosperity gospel m message going on here, but rich in faith to cope with all the tragedy and transitions of life. You know, all the ups and the downs. That that community is there to mutually support one another as a community. But then also to go on and support other communities. Because this community has been blessed. This community seems to be wealthy. 
and it's being asked by Paul to share that wealth with others who don't have as much. So, you know, it's not a matter of um, relief for other one and pressure on you. It's a question of fair balance, that your present abundance and their need, that you see this other community, you see how they're struggling, and you say, we can help. Because at some stage, and we've all been through this, haven't we? The tables will be turned. And at some stage, we will need to ask other people for help. And the question is, will they deliver? And hopefully they will, because we have been generous in the first place, recognizing how God's generosity was to us in the giving of Jesus. And then he quotes that little bit, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little, which goes back to, um, if you know your um, Old Testament, uh, your Hebrew Bible, goes back to those um, collecting manna outside the camp while the um, uh, people of Israel were on their exodus journey from um, Egypt to Israel. Yep, every day there would be manna that they would collect, store it in a pot, there'd be enough. Didn't matter how busy, how industrious they were or not, they would collect and there would be enough for that day. And if they tried to collect um, an extra day's ration, that all went all maggoty. Yep. Um, and if they tried to, you know, so there was always enough always enough and that's a really interesting question isn't it because i think it was the um, skidelskys um economists who wrote the book um uh is there ever enough because sometimes uh, we go the other way don't we we always want the latest gizmo with with we you know it does all the wonderful things um and uh yeah so that's a really interesting challenge there but i want to move on to the gospel and just pick out a couple of interesting kind of points for us to think about, um, which is related to that question about is it enough that, that Paul posits, that Paul poses to the church, the early church. We have a story of Jesus. He's, uh, we're in the fifth chapter of Mark's gospel. He's working his way around the towns around um, Jerusalem. He's preaching and healing and teaching and doing all the things that he will be recognized for and a couple of things happen. We've just had the stilling of the storm. We've just had that um, uh, uh, going across the sea and starting in a new place. And again, the, the, boat, the, the, the crowds gathered around him and he was by the lake. Then the leader of the synagogue named Jairus came up and saw him and fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her that she may be well and live now there's a couple of interesting points going on here interestingly Jairus is named is as very rare in Mark's gospel I mean I hate to say this but very few of the women are named who helped Jesus but not all that many of the men are named either apart from the disciples so here's Jairus, here's somebody who was obviously well known in that community and um, powerful, perhaps the leader of the synagogue, would have had a lot of political authority, a lot of social clout. And here he is asking for help from this itinerant teacher and healer. So that's the first thing to think about. Then, of course, they set out on their journey, but there's a load of people pressing in. And what happens is that Jesus feels the power go out from him. And he says, who touched my clothes? <laughs> you can imagine the disciples going, Jesus, what are you on about, mate? Look, we're all being, we're all being pushed. We're all being jostled. There's loads of people. How do you know that that's happened? But this woman comes forward who has had an issue of blood for 12 years, made her ritually unclean literally unclean all the time it's not something we kind of um we have the kind of concept for in our in our western communities now um without you know without sounding kind of trite about it but it meant that she was banished always to the edge of things that she might turn up to a village wedding but she would never be invited to sit with people She'd just be sort of grudgingly given a place and people would not sit next to her because coming into contact with her would make them unclean as well. And maybe what she had was contagious. 
you know and i mean you know if she has this issue of blood then she's also probably anemic as well poor thing so there's all these different things going on and yet she has hope she has hope that this jesus bloke whom she's heard about this healer will be able to do for her what no one else has been able to do and caught up in the crowd interesting isn't it in the crowd she's she's just one of the crowd yeah people don't know her or her story she reaches out and touches the hem of his cloak i remind you that when isaiah has the vision of god in isaiah 6 i think it is what does he see he sees the hem of god's robe that's i think there's a deliberate thing there you know I think it's a definitely, definitely a link. And her illness is healed and she is now restored. God's generosity is to her to restore her health, to make her to be part of that community. So not only to restore her health, but her self um, belief and her, the respect within with which she is held within the community in which she is part of as well so all of those things are happening at that moment and that's the fact that jesus has the power to do those things that he does it and then he doesn't he doesn't accuse the woman of stealing <laughs> it's interesting isn't it what he does is he says daughter your faith has made you well go in peace be healed of your disease, confirming, affirming what has happened in the sight of everybody. So that all the people who did know what was wrong with her now know that she is made well, now know that she is like them. Then, of course, we get to Jairus' daughter. Again, we don't know her name. We never, we never find out what this little girl is called. But you get the impression that she's an only child. There's no other, you know, when you think about who, who is, who's are, are, um, uh, uh, around, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead, you know. And when they came to the house, they saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And there, would, there are, in that culture, the idea, there are people who are professional mourners. That's what they do. They come to a house and they would weep and wail outside the house to as a as a kind of you know well you can't, you can't send a text message <laughs> to say to people somebody's died how else do you spread that information you have those people come and they weep and they wail and everybody knows that the tragedy has struck that house so they're there the child is not dead but sleeping says jesus just <laughs> cracky <laughs> you sure you know how do you know how do you know about these things but of course paul also has that problem doesn't he um, when early christians started to die before jesus came back the question was what happens they are sleeping in the lord says paul so that you know there's a definite kind of ambiguity about the wording that jesus is using there so he um, takes puts them all outside puts all this baying crowd this weeping wailing crowd outside um, and those who were with and went into where the child was and he laid her hands on her and said little girl get up and she got up and she was about 12 years of age now that's a little also significant because 12 was about the age of puberty that was about the age when that transition moved from childhood to well adulthood it wasn't so much of an adolescence in those days you know that they would be um uh, be ready to be married off and and have children and all of that and if this is the only child of the synagogue leader then actually his um memory is dependent on that girl having children and if that girl does not have children his memory is lost in a non-written, in a non, um, you know, a non-literary community where stories are told and word of mouth is important, those things are important as well. So that's an interesting challenge too, isn't it? That in these 
those words that Jesus says, little girl, get up. He's bringing her back to this world. Um, and at that, you know, oops, surprise, surprise, um, the girl does indeed get up and they uh, were overcome with amazement and he strictly ordered them that no one should know this. Uh, sorry, what? <laughs> How is that possible? And told them, give us something to eat. How can you say not to tell anybody what happened? Because they would see her, the girl, who was supposed to be dead. They'd send home the, the whalers and the mourners. It would be pretty bleeding obvious. So I'm not quite sure what that's doing in there. Jesus, though, I think, is recognising here that there's a risk of a kind of pandemic if re a response. Oh, everybody's ill. We must get to Jesus. Oh, this is person's died. We must get to Jesus straight away. That the rumours will go round that he brings people back from the dead just like that. And actually, how long, you know, I mean, it's interesting with the story about Lazarus in John's Gospel. That's, you know, how long do we wait <laughs> before we present with Jesus this body and expect him to revive it? That's, that's I think, what he's getting at. This is, not a, this is not an instant kind of recall you to life moment in that sense. This is a particular miracle for a particular family, a particular village, a particular community. So finally then, I just want to say, I think these two readings point to the way in which generosity changes the world. The generosity of the church, of the people of the church, makes the world a better place because it mirrors the generosity of God in giving us Jesus. And it's a bit of a trite thing to say, absolutely. But I think it's quite a valuable thing to say, because actually, if we live our lives in generosity, we will make life better for people around us. And there will come a time when we will need other people's generosity. And it's no bad thing to think on these two stories and perhaps think about where we can be generous with what God has given us so that others too may have life and life in all its fullness. Amen. Our affirmation of faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn then comes from the pen of Kate Wilkinson. Uh, May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. And the music St Leonard's was written especially by Cyril Barham Gold um, to fit this tune. Um, St Leonard's being the church, I think, where Kate Wilkinson went, um, uh, well, attended um, when she wrote this uh, hymn. May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. <laughs>
We come then to our prayers. Let us pray. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace that comes from God alone, for the unity of all peoples, for our salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the Church of Christ, for Richard, our Bishop. For our Church as it emerges from COVID-19, and the challenges that it faces. We pray especially for congregations thinking and praying about their future. As we continue these video services, we pray for those too, perhaps unknown to us, who will be watching them later today, maybe next week, maybe in a year's time. We pray that the goodness of God will fill their lives. We pray for all who belong to the church, no matter how tenuously. May we be blessed by the power of the Spirit. For the whole people of God, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the nations of the world, especially at this time, we pray for all those countries suffering the ravages of COVID-19. For those who have to administer vaccines and those in our hospitals treating people. Pray too for the nations of the world where they don't have such wonderful health service as we have. The places that struggle to cope with treating many people. Particularly Brazil and India, Colombia and elsewhere. Pray also for those caught up in the collapsed building in Florida, for the rescue workers as they take on the dangerous task of trying to find those who are still alive, for those perhaps who are trapped. Continue to pray for the nations torn apart by civil conflict, for Ethiopia and Afghanistan, for Syria and Lebanon, for Israel and Palestine. We never know quite how our prayers help these places. But we pray for them nonetheless, because God works through the power of prayer, through the power of the Spirit. Let us pray also for Elizabeth, our Queen, and for all in authority. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this village where we live, Perhaps we live in a town or in a bigger community. For our neighbourhood and all the important parts of that neighbourhood. Schools and pubs and shops and post offices and places where people meet and play. For all that builds up our common community. For our neighbours, for our friends. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and the will to conserve it. Especially we pray after the disappointment of the latest G7, that we will take seriously what we are doing to this planet. And we will work to make it a place for generations to come, where they may thrive. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the aged and the infirm, for the widows and the orphans, for the sick and the suffering, for those on our hearts today, for family and friends, for those feeling marginalised and excluded from our society and community, for the lost and the lonely. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, for all who remember and care for them. Let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. For ourselves and our journey of faith, for us on our pilgrimage, for our relationship with God, 
and the power of the Spirit to work in our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the dying, for those who mourn the death of family and friends from across the community in which we live and further afield. That even in sadness and grief, they may know the care of Christ. For the faithful whom we entrust to the Lord in hope, as we look forward to the day when we share in the fullness of the resurrection, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. Rejoicing in the communion of Mary and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to God. For yours is the majesty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And our collect for this fourth Sunday after Trinity. O God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong, nothing is holy, increase and multiply upon us your mercy, that with you as our ruler and guide, we may so pass through things temporal that we lose not our hold on things eternal. Grant this, Heavenly Father, for our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And so we come to the peace. We are all one in Christ Jesus. We belong to him through faith, heirs of the promise of the spirit of peace. And the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace be with you and your household this day. And so to our closing hymn, which is um, one that really kind of sends us back out into the world, which seems a bit of an odd thing to choose in the midst of a COVID-19 lockdown. But I think it still carries that sense of urgency and of reminding us that we are uh, messengers for God's kingdom. We have a gospel to proclaim. Words by Edward J. Burns and the tune, of course, is Fulda uh, by William Gardner. We have a gospel to proclaim. Good news for all in all the earth. Thank you.
And so to our closing blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Thank you for joining with us um, today for our worship. As I say, we're still kind of pondering the future of these um, services. We'll keep going for another few weeks um, and then wait until um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announces what's happening for the middle of July. Um, and then we might move to a slightly different um, uh, rotor, um, uh, particularly over the summer, perhaps um, in the autumn. Again, we don't know what's coming. So um, we're going to be very flexible in terms of our use of these services. But thank you once again for watching. And of course, as I would say, do share these services with your family and friends. Um, post the link on Facebook and emails, whatever, if you've enjoyed this service. Um, and also do comment on the services as well. It's always nice to have your feedback. If there's a hymn you've liked or you don't like or whatever, just let me know, because it's really nice to have that feedback. Um, and so we can uh, shape these services perhaps a little bit as well as we go. Look after one another and each and, and yourselves and may God bless you. We'll see you again soon. Goodbye.